Hi, welcome to BSF. My name is Vicki, and we are going to be studying John 18 today. So let's pray, and we will dig right on in. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you for this time that we have to study your word. Thank you that the words that you've preserved uh, reveal your son to us. Show us uh, who he is and help us uh, know how to respond to him and to live in this world. Lord, we pray that as we study your word, that you would be with us. Your spirit would open our eyes, uh, soften our hearts in places where they're hard, strengthen us where we are feeling weak, encourage us where we are discouraged. Uh, Please, Lord, open our ears that we would hear. And Father, we pray that these minutes that we spend together in uh, John 18 would not uh, be in vain, that you would continue your good work in those of us who follow Christ. And uh, Lord, we pray that uh, anyone within the sound of my voice would be able to see and hear Jesus more clearly and to respond to him uh, as you would have them to do. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So my dad tells a story of about when I was three And he and I were driving uh, from the town where my dad worked to go to where we lived, our farm out in the country. And the car that we were riding in was, uh, as my dad tells it, one of our less dependable cars. We had a number of less dependable cars in those days. And as best as he recalls, uh, the car, if you're interested, you're a car person, Uh, was an old brown Nash Rambler. And so dad had purchased this car second, third, or fourth hand from a friend. Uh, Anyway, the car was pretty old and pretty unreliable. Sometimes it ran. That was about the best thing that my dad has said could be said about it. So dad had left work and picked me up from the babysitters and he was driving us home. And after we turned off the county highway onto the country road, 2400N, which is uh, was the main road that would go to our house. For some reason, the car stopped running, and we came to a stop. My dad got out, and he popped the hood. He was trying to figure out what to do, and he says, I don't remember this, but he says, my little voice piped up from inside the car, Daddy, fix it with your hands. I looked up at him, evidently, with absolute faith that whatever the problem, that my dad, and I knew that my dad could fix it with his hands. I'd never seen my dad in that exact situation, but I'd seen enough. I knew my dad could fix things, cars, tractors, furnaces, toys, and with that trust, I sat on the sticky vinyl back seat. I could ask him to take care of the problem and to get us home safely." Well, our trust, my trust, proved to be well-founded. After a few minutes, my dad did something under the hood, and without even any tools, my dad fixed the car with his hands. He got back in, and we drove home. When your life comes to a stop, like an un- unreliable old car on a desolate county road, where do you look? Sometimes you may be able to get out, pop the hood, and fiddle around uh, on the inside until your life gets back going again, and other times you are as helpless as a three-year-old in the face of the unreliable Nash Rambler. It's not if your life and mine will take unexpected turns, it's when. It happens to all of us. Uh, You may get laid off or get rear-ended. There may be a routine health test that comes back abnormal. Uh, You may get a text today or a phone call with some news that that totally blindsides you. Uh, Maybe that has happened to you even this week. And not just in your life and my life, but even as we look at the larger picture of what's going on in this world, on the news it sometimes seems like evil is triumphing. The powerful get richer and the poor get trod on and exploited. Uh, Wars, battles, uh, weather accidents, natural things that happen. This is a hard place to live. Who can fix it? Who is in control of this crazy world? Can we have any hope? 
That is the whole point of the Bible passage, or one of the main points I suggest to you of the Bible passage we're looking at tonight. Uh, The Gospel of John, uh, the author, John, wants you and me to understand that, yes, there is hope. Your life is safe. Your life, my life, our lives are only safe in the hands of Jesus, God's perfect Son. The Bible is not downplaying any of the chaos of our lives. But God can fix anything. He's that big, that powerful. He's in control. He knows what He's doing. He's mysterious, and sometimes we don't understand how His good, victorious plans can allow things, at least from our vantage, to look so dire that by all appearances, evil is triumphing. But God is still in control, and we can trust Him. When you and I falter, God is seated on His throne. History is firmly in His hands. Your eyes and my eyes may drift from Him. Their circumstances may shake us. And yet, His eyes, His hands, never drift from us, never let us go. Those of us who have trusted in Jesus Christ as our Savior. And I think as we study tonight that we can learn that only Jesus can fix this broken world. In fact, that's exactly what He's doing. You and I should look to Him and to trust that He's doing it, even though His ways are not our ways, and His wisdom is not our wisdom. So, open your Bibles. We're going to be going through the first 27 verses of chapter 18 of the book of John. We have now arrived at the pinnacle of John's gospel, what's called the passion narrative. And this passion narrative isn't that's not in the scriptures in the book of John, but it's from the Latin word passio, which means suffering. And so, this is a, uh, this is an, a mini narrative within John's larger narrative of to talk about how uh, Jesus has suffered. And it consists of four scenes, and the first two we're going to be covering tonight. So, the first scene is in 18, 1 through 11, uh, Jesus' betrayal and arrest, and then in 18, 12 to 27, Jesus' religious trial. So, we'll be covering both those sections tonight. In fact, those are our first two divisions, uh, Jesus' betrayal and arrest, and then Jesus' religious tri- trial, 12 to 27. The third and fourth scene uh, that, we'll be coming, that we'll be covering in the coming weeks, actually, as we uh, get closer to celebrating uh, the time when when this ha- the time of year when this happened, coming to the Passover time. Uh, so John chapter eighteen verse twenty eight to nineteen sixteen, he has his political trial, and that will be before the Roman ruler Pontius Pilate. And then in chapter nineteen seventeen to forty two, we have his crucifixion, death, and burial. So betrayal and arrest tonight. Religious trial tonight, in coming times, political trial, and Jesus' crucifixion, death, and burial. So, let's, uh, let's jump into our first division, chapter 18, 1 through 11, and we'll see uh, Jesus submit to the, to the Father's plan. Uh, he is betrayed and arrested in the garden. So, John transition us, transitions us to this new scene in chapter 18, verse 1. Uh, so, when I'll read that, when he, that's Jesus, had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. So, having uh, said the, or your translation may say, having said these things, uh, mine in the NIV says, when he had finished praying. So, what things that rem- reminds us that Jesus has just finished preparing his disciples in the upper room, and uh, preparing himself uh, through prayer, though the focus, of course, was uh, even and then he prays uh, m- very much for believers and his specific 11 disciples. And so, this also points back to even the beginning of chapter 13. So, having having uh, pr- said these things, uh, Jesus then went out to, with his disciples. It's possible that he had already started this journey and it was under route. If you remember chapter 14, verse 31, it says, uh, uh, John records for us Jesus' words, come now, let us leave. 
And so, and then he goes on and talks about the true vine. Perhaps that part of the prayer is when they're kind of transitioning out. But here we go. Uh, they are now. John places us in a physical setting uh, in Jerusalem and in Israel, and they are leaving the city proper of Jerusalem, going uh, through the you know through the wall of the city and going down across the Kidron Valley and going up to the Mount of Olives. And so it was Passover, so the moon likely lit their way, unless it was a cloudy night. Uh, they were walking in the dark. Now, walking in the dark isn't easy, but this was probably a familiar path. They had visited this olive grove regularly before, and uh, that John tells us that in verse 2. Now, Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. And so, as they were walking uh, there, the disciples may have felt like the car of their lives had unexpectedly veered off course and come to a dead halt. Uh, they had surely known that the religious uh, Jewish religious leaders desired to arrest and kill Jesus. Jesus had always proven to have the upper hand. Twice they had eluded Jesus had eluded their attempts to stone him in chapter 8 and chapter 10. Uh, there's previous attempts to arrest Jesus had failed. Remember, the soldiers came back and said, no one ever spoke as as this man speaks. Um, in any verbal battle, Jesus always has had the last word. And so far, leaders have been afraid, afraid to seize, seize Jesus in a, in a public place. And so, what's more, Jesus, we've seen him uh, know how to withdraw and to slip away when he did not uh, want the the focus or attention. Jesus clearly had powers and knowledge uh, to do this, and I suggest to you, beyond human ability, has been uh, John has been depicting his uh, his powers. But now something was going to happen, and they must have been thinking about that. Jesus had just been telling them he was going to leave them, and uh, from verse uh, chapter sixteen, verse six. Jesus names it and says their hearts are filled with grief. And so they uh, are are walking in the dark to this garden and uh, probably sad, uh, but not really knowing wh- what's going on and how this had happened. And so we get to the garden scene and the scene in the garden has four events. And so I'm going to make four observations. Maybe I better, uh, I'm just going to read picking up in verse 3 and read to 11, and then I'll share the four observations. How about that? So, uh, Jesus came to the, I'm sorry, Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, I am he, Jesus said, and Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? And they, t- and they said, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's ear, cutting off his right ear, struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Okay, so let's make four observations about this scene in the garden. So, the first one, uh, number one, sometime after Jesus and his disciples uh, entered the garden, a huge posse shows up, this uh, armed and carrying torches. And based on the Greek word that's been translated here, which is related to our, our word cohort, a cohort was technically one-tenth of a legion. A legion was 6,000 soldiers, so one-tenth of that would be 600. It's a lot of people. John is using this word, and it it images in our mind 
a huge amount of soldiers. Um, and it's possible then that up to 600 men entered the garden. Perhaps there was a, a very, you know, it wasn't maybe exactly that number, but enough of this, uh, enough of the number came that uh, this, it could be trustworthy that John would say uh, there's a, a cohort. Surely it felt overwhelming uh, for certainly the disciples. And Judas, Jesus' former disciple, was leading them. John mentions this three times. So this is not a surprise to Jesus, nor was it a chance encounter. Remember in chapter 6, 64, Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. In thirteen twenty one, he says, one of you will betray me. And so with Judas, the Roman soldiers, temple guards, Jewish leaders, uh, among the torches and weapons. So those are the people in this garden and Jesus and it. So we've have Jesus and Judas and then uh, the, the, the group with them. But there was also someone else lurking who was in that garden also. John told us in 13.2 that the devil prompted Judas. And then in 13.27 that Satan entered Judas. So who was also in the garden? Satan, God's enemy. And so maybe it's not Judas being paired against Jesus, but Satan, and as he is, has been possessed and entered Judas. So you have these two adversaries in the garden. And uh, in verses two and three, then we see that evil had entered the garden just as he was in the first garden in Genesis three. And in some ways, this is an echo of the, that battle in the first garden. And so, uh, so number one, you know, that, that's the setting. Uh, two, we are meant to see Jesus' intentionality and control. Not only has Jesus intentionally gone to the very place he knew Jesus expected him to be, Jesus intentionally initiates the proceedings. John wants us to understand uh, from verse four, Jesus knew fully what would happen. And so Jesus, not the army, not the soldiers, not Judas, not the priest, uh, not any of the rel- leaders asks the question, whom are you seeking? And he identifies himself as Jesus of Nazareth. And I suggest to you simultaneously, he identifies himself as more than that. Uh, What our English translations uh, often render as I am he is literally in Greek, I am. Uh, As Jesus had said in chapter four and six and eight, He's referring to himself as I am. Uh, I am is the Greek equivalent uh, here of God's covenant name that he had given to Moses in Exodus 3, the divine name of God uh, that's formed on the root of the verb to be. So, uh, he refers to himself as I am. And so, in these words was more than just information. Here I am, this is, uh, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. There was something mysterious and powerful was revealed when Jesus said that, such that he claimed identity with God. Uh, So, let's read 6 again. When Jesus said, I am Literally, he said, I am. They drew back and fell to the ground. Jesus' words carry the power of his majesty. Uh, So, third point, Jesus set boundaries on what is going to happen. Look at verse 8. I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. Even in crisis, Jesus' focus is on protecting his disciples, just as he promised uh, he, Peter is swinging a sword, sword around. Uh, it feels like to me, I'm, I'm reading this wildly, perhaps clumsily. Um, I suggest to you that it took a, sp- a specific miraculous work of Jesus' authoritative words to ensure that Peter was not killed, that no further blood was shed, and all disciples left that garden alive and free. Uh, Jesus was the only one who was bound. Uh, Jesus, so number four, Jesus always has the bigger picture in mind. Verse 11, Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given to me? Uh, Jesus was fully convinced that being arrested was God's plan for him. 
He was obedient to this plan. This was the cup that the Father had given to him. And so verse 11 is the focal point of uh, of of this cha- chapter, and, and perhaps even uh, it's one of the focal points of the entire passion narrative, um, that Jesus was voluntarily submitting to the Father's plan for him, and he was saying that he would drink down the cup that God had set before him, the cup of suffering, the cup of God's just wrath over human rebellion, to drink it all down, and so that none of God's just wrath is left for any of those who believe in Jesus, that we can receive the cup of God's blessing. Uh, Without him drinking this down, we were, my friends, estranged from God's cup of blessing. That is an image in the Old Testament. Uh, Psalm 23 is a very uh, uh, notable image of that. My cup overflows. And, uh, And yet, without Jesus' intervention, without him as a suffering servant to to suffer and bear our iniquities, we could not taste that because of what happened in the garden in Genesis 3, that our great, 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 great grandparents, Adam and Eve, that they failed and uh, and rebelled against God's good purpose, and the just consequence of that was death. So, to this purpose, as Jesus says to Pilate later, he came into this world. So, he drank it. He drank the cup so that you and I do not have to drink God's wrath. Jesus obediently submitted to his death out of love for the Father and for us. Shall I not drink the cup? He is the Passover lamb who by his blood takes away the sin of the world that John the Baptist uh, taught talked about prophetically in chapter 129. Okay, a principle I think that we can learn from this section is that one of them, many things we could learn, right? But uh, eternal life is available because Jesus is obedient. Eternal life is available because Jesus is and was and always will be obedient. Uh, We have eternal life because Jesus is and was and will be fully obedient to his Father. We are saved by works, but not our own. We are saved because of his obedience to submit to his Father's plan. So, uh, I really enjoy cooking, and I, uh, but I cannot follow a recipe. I, I want to throw in a little sage. I will go on the internet and I will find uh, the best recipe for whatever, uh, pizza dough or uh, egg casserole or a salad. And so I'll, I'll, you know, jot it down. But then I'll, as I'm making it, I start to think, oh, this would be better if I put in a little sage or, uh, oh, I could use up some extra bananas. Um, but <clears throat> some of these changes come certainly because of my creativity, which is uh, sometimes a good thing. And then uh, there are changes that come just because I think that I know better that whoever wrote that recipe. Uh, eggs, for example, in my opinion, should always be in yeast bread dough. Uh, there's better rising, better color. I have my reasons and I can justify those based on my experience and arguably from my arrogance. Uh, so we must understand that though Jesus, uh, Jesus, though mysterious and creative, never deviates from his father's recipe, from his father's plan. He trusts his father implicitly and he carries out exactly every step. He never spoke in his earthly ministry a word not from his father. He never healed someone whom his father did not direct him to. Uh, In the smallness of my mind, this can sound incredibly boring, like a painting in the paint-by-number picture. And if you're like me uh, in, in thinking that this is, you know, wouldn't it be just so boring to kind of like a, you know, it feels like a robot, Uh, You know, that's my knee-jerk reaction. But that is an incredibly, the Bible suggests, this is incredibly mistaken. Uh, Jesus' relationship with his Father is the richest, fullest, most fulfilling relationship. Uh, And so, thus, obedience, Jesus' obedience and submission to the Father's will is not just following steps like a robot, but pursuing relationship with his Father, Uh, God the Father, whose loving design for you and me is that we would know Him. That 
Jesus has prayed in John seventeen three to know him is eternal life. So Jesus shows us true obedience and gives us confidence that his father is fixing it with his hands. Uh, Jesus went to the cross in his death with absolute confidence that God the Father would fix it, that he would not be abandoned to the grave. He would raise Jesus up after three days in the grave and dead, back to restored uh, fullest life um, and a resurrected life where death would be defeated, sin would be defeated, Satan, God's enemy, was defeated at the cross. So Jesus' uh, example offers us eternal life. To receive it, we must follow God's plan. There is no alternate way to God to be reconciled to God, to know Him, to receive His good blessing that lasts, uh, to have human flourishing outside. There's no alternate way to any of those things outside of his son, Jesus. And so, I, I wonder, have you trusted him? Uh, have you trusted Jesus for eternal life? That is God's plan. Uh, do not delay. I encourage you. God's good plan for your life and mine does not stop at our receiving eternal life. Our lives are part of God's amazing recipe to bring healing to this world and glory to Jesus. Uh, by His Spirit and His transformation of us, uh, that He gives us hearts that were capable of loving Jesus. It will result by His power in lives, yours and mine, that that delight in obeying Jesus and desire to follow God's plan. God gets up into your business and mine. He has a clear plan for you and me. Uh, he has a plan for how you speak about people in your neighborhood, in your church, how you speak about people who are on the world stage, how you act toward your enemies, what you do with your body, your sexuality, how you spend your money, how you spend your time, how you regard people of low position, how you regard people of high position. Uh, where are your actions or thoughts out of line with God's plan for you. Why do you think that is? And how might you pray this week for strength to follow Jesus in obedience? Our eternal life is available only because Jesus is obedient. Uh, your life and mine are only safe in the hands of Jesus, God's Son. Okay, let's go to our second uh, division, our second scene here in the Passion Narrative chapter 18, verses 12 to 17, we see that Jesus uh, and those around him are put on trial. Jesus remains steadfast. He's bound, but he's steadfast. Peter, who's juxtaposed with Jesus, uh, seems to carefully construct that. Uh, Peter is free, and yet he's he is not able he denies his identity as Jesus' disciple. He denies Jesus. So it seems that in this section, uh, John carefully has constructed this to juxtapose episodes or scenes with Jesus and scenes with Peter. Uh, John moves the camera inside with Jesus, then outside, inside, outside. He's going to continue that pattern in the trial with Pontius Pilate. Pilate moves inside, then outside. Um, so inside... Uh, we know, we've already seen in the book of John, Jesus knows how to slip away, um, but he permits himself to be bound. Verse 12, uh, first, uh, Jesus is brought to Annas, who was Caiaphas's father-in-law, and this is the beginning of Jesus' trial, the two parts, Jewish and Roman, religious and secular or political, and so this is the, this is the religious trial that is captured here in the book of John, not in any way denying, uh, I suggest to you, the, the other details that are recorded in other Gospels, but this isn't John's emphasis. Uh, so, he is, he is taking Jesus to Annas um, with uh, Caiaphas's, uh, you know, and Caiaphas is, is evoked in our memory uh, as the high priest that the Romans had appointed. In verse 14, John reminds us, Caiaphas was the one who advised the Jews that it would be good for, if one man died for the people. And so, uh, but Jesus is brought to Annas, who was the father-in-law. Uh, historians tell us that Annas was a rid was the high priest, and then the Romans came in and deposed him and set up Caiaphas in his 
in his place. So they're both sort of high priest. Um, it's a it's a little bit tricky of an uh, of an idea. Um, and so John is only describing the part with Annas, even though the other gospels tell about uh, Caiaphas, Jesus before Caiaphas, and Jesus before the Sanhedrin. Um, <clears throat> Okay, um, we'll talk next week about uh, maybe why there's a Roman trial, why there's a Jewish trial and Roman trial. Like, why are those uh, both important? They are two different sets of laws, two different methods of trials. Um, and so, uh, we're going to, let's let's jump into verse uh, 19 then. Um, are we doing that? I guess, yeah. Okay, all right. We're, we, we have a section here with, with Peter. And, uh, but I'm going to, I guess we're going to jump down and talk about Jesus first, and then we'll circle back and, and think about Peter. So, uh, we'll, we'll do, hop around a little bit, and I apologize for that. Okay, so we'll read, um, we'll see, Annas makes preliminary examination of Jesus. So, verse 19, Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I've spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews came together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. Uh, when Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest? He demanded. If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Annas sent him, still bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So we see Jesus' words here show him uh, in c- composed and in control. Uh, in fact, who is on trial? Uh, the, in he- the book of Hebrews tells us, Jesus is the true high priest, the great high priest. And so, there are these two priests in, uh, in, in conversation here. Jesus answers Annas and the official with questions that provide them the opportunity to self-reflect. Um, why question me? Jesus asks. So, there's an implication that these are bogus proceedings. In Jewish law, someone is innocent until witnesses proved confirm their guilt. And so, Jesus is pointing to the reality that Annas is not seeking truth and justice that's a reality, but only evidence that would incriminate Jesus. He says, if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Uh, The suggestion here, its implication is your agenda is not justice, but maintaining power. And that question of Jesus implicated not only the official, but also Annas, who condoned that violence. So, Annas is unable to find incriminating evidence, and he does not turn, this is an opportunity for him to turn from the path, and he did not do that, and he sent Jesus on to Caiaphas, sort of like, yeah, the first crack at a Rubik's Cube, couldn't fix it, uh, couldn't figure it out, and pass it on to someone else. Um, And so, let's Although the Jewish charges, uh, you know, seem strong, we, the other Gospels talk about that. Uh, well, ironically, this was a sham. They wanted Jesus' death, not justice. And ironically, uh, as in alluded to unwittingly by Caiaphas, and is mentioned back in verse 14, uh, God is using their evil actions to accomplish His greatest good, salvation not just for the people, but for that is available for the whole world, for not just Israelites, people descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but for all peoples, all nations, tribes, that they can turn to Jesus and be full citizens in God's kingdom. So, uh, in this section, uh, you know, little mini section, I think we we can see if you fight Jesus, you will not win. Uh, Opposing Jesus only holds a mirror to oneself. So, meanwhile, while Jesus is proving steadfast and true and faithful, um, even though he's bound, fallible Peter is spinning out of control. So, we see after Jesus' arrest, Peter follows Jesus at a distance. So does another disciple, uh, verse 15, Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Um, And so, this is almost universally thought of as the, the disciple John and the servant girl standing at the courtyard asked Simon Peter when he comes, uh, verse 17, you are not one of his disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. So they're going into the high priest's courtyard 
it seems trying to stay near to Jesus a little bit, but but still holding back, not able to stand uh, strong. And um, the the question that the servant girl asked, because in those in those days you didn't have backyards per se, you had enclosed areas. So there would be a, a walled courtyard, and that uh, a wealthy people you would have people guarding the gate, literally. And so this uh, this girl is manning the gate. She's a she's the the porter or portress. Is that a word? Uh, it to to in this courtyard, and she asks a question that expects a negative response. It's not accusatory, and it seems. Do you notice this? You are uh, you are not one of his disciples, are you? Uh, other translations say you are not also one of his disciples. So there's already there's a there's a subtle implication that Peter's maybe not the only disciple. There's the other disciple that's there, and yet uh, Peter is tired and shaken, afraid. And he says, no, uh, I am not. And so there's a contrasting echo. Jesus is bold, I am. I am um, from the first division to Peter's, I am not. I am not. I am not. And uh, so, and he, he goes on and he denies it a second time, verses 25 to 27. Uh, that's twice more. Um, As Simon Peter stood warming himself, he was asked, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him, Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? And again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. So Luke Luke tells us, not here in this gospel, that uh, Jesus turned and looked at Peter at that moment, and Peter wept bitterly. Uh, Grief over sin, uh, not just his consequences, does reflect a heart near to God. And so, John doesn't mention this, though he undoubtedly knew it, uh, especially if he if he was indeed the other disciple, um, why not? Why This is not John's focus. John is focused on Jesus. And specifically like in 18.9, uh, Jesus' words are coming true. Jesus had told Peter that this would happen. So if you look back to chapter 13, 37 to 38, uh, he says in 20, <clears throat> this is exactly what happened. <coughs> Excuse me. Will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Exactly that that happens. Um, 13.21, he says, one of you is going to betray us. 14.30 and 31, the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me, but the the world must learn that I love the Father and I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. 15.25, they hated me without reason. 16.32, (coughs) A uh, time is coming and has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. So what? What are we supposed to make of that? What Jesus says comes true. Why did Jesus say these things? Remember what he said in thirteen nineteen. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am. Again, that's I am, I am he, um, that he's saying that uh, God's covenant name again and identifying as uh, as God himself. Uh, In 1429, he says, I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. And believe what? Uh, Believe that indeed, as John has been pointing us toward, uh, chapter 20, verse 31, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And of course, he said that to his disciples who were already believing. How can he say, then you will believe? Because belief, my friends, grows. It doesn't stay the same. Belief must always be growing. There's a new levels of belief as we get to walk in this world and experience God's faithfulness, his kindness, his goodness, his righteousness, his holiness, his gentleness. Uh, we get to experience that and to believe even more uh, that he is God, Jesus, the Son of God, and that God uh, has given us, given Jesus his life and raised him from the dead for us. 
Okay. Uh, so, and in 1633, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So, here's a principle for our second division as we wrap up. Even when we falter, Jesus proves true. Even when we falter, Jesus proves true. Jesus' words will prove faithful, every single one. Jesus' character will prove faithful. He will never be out of control, never falter. He will be steadfast and steady, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus' work will prove faithful. How he acts in history will be consistent with his faithful character and God's redemptive plan, to which he is fully submissive and delightedly obedient. Um, He is the one who rescues and saves. Uh, He cannot stop being faithful, truthful, and obedient, uh, submitting to his Father and doing his Father's will. He will not stop doing that. Um, And sometimes uh, you you might, uh, we're we're coming into the season where you might get a chocolate bunny. uh, But realize, as I think probably most of us did that we, if we had chocolate bunnies as children, uh, you get this giant chocolate bunny and you're super excited about it. And then you take it out and you bite into it and it crumbles because you realize it was hollow. There wasn't anything in it. It was just a shell or worse. Maybe it's filled with marshmallow, which is a horrible thing to do with chocolate, perfectly good chocolate, where the inside does not match the outside. But on the contrast, Jesus is not that. He is not hollow. He is not filled with things that are different from what is on the outside. He has given us sufficient evidence that he will always prove true. He will be 100% consistent on the inside as to what he's complained, com, as what he's com, claimed about himself. 100% loving and wise and faithful, merciful and just. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Every single moment in history um, that has happened, that is happening, that will happen, will prove Jesus to be true. So I wonder, what do you expect from Jesus? How have you experienced the reality of his character in the past? And even when you fail, because we will fail, we will falter, uh, and to succumb to a besetting sin some once more, or even when others fail, uh, even those when those who should, who lo- love Jesus and should reflect His character, don't. Uh, even when you fail, when I fail, when others fail, uh, Jesus will prove true. And sometimes you may wonder, in dark moments, where Jesus is. Does He hear your prayers? Has He forgotten you? And at as as we sing uh, in the church often, um, even in those moments, Jesus is true. Will you wait for him? The night will not last forever. How does that comfort you? Jesus' arrest and trial was perhaps the darkest period of human history leading to his death on the cross. And yet it was, in some ways, Jesus' greatest moment. Why? Through the cross, Jesus accomplished the mission of fully disclosing the Father to us. He fully carried out His Father's plan of redemption. Is it not comforting to know that even when all appears to be in chaos, Jesus is firmly and demonstrably in control of all things? Our lives, friends, are only safe in the hands of Jesus, God's Son. When our lives, like cars, veer off the road or stop working, when there's Uh, things that are terrible or unexpected that happen, uh, we are only safe in the hands of Jesus. His obedience made our restoration, our redemption, our eternal life possible, our flourishing possible. Then even when we falter, Jesus will prove true. He and his Father are fixing this world steadfastly, faithfully, according to the Father's plan. Uh, I encourage you, I encourage myself, We should remember what He has done thus far and trust Him with our present and with our future. What comfort does that give to you? And how might that impact you this week? Let's pray. Lord, thank You for how You care for us, for You love us, You pursue us, and You have given us everything. Uh, You've given up Your Son that He and He so willingly laid down His life uh, to pay for our our debt of sin, to drink down the cup cup of your wrath and judgment that you, that we justly have deserved. And 
in your generosity and grace, you count righteous, you count faith in Jesus, in that sacrifice, in him as uh, righteousness to restore us uh, and reconcile us to you. Lord, would you keep your work um, going in us, we'll glorify Jesus in our lives, and help us to be faithful um, to the end of all of our days. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, friends.